the maternal grandson of Neichiro Nakagawa. Um, I will include a, a, his life story into as well as the um, experiences that I have uh, gained from our trip to Hawaii Island. Um, Neichiro Nakagawa was born in December 1889. At age 16 in 1906, he arrived in Hawaii. And one of the, um, indicate, what he indicated on the ship's manifest that I found, indicated that he was, he could read and write. So he was educated through the sixth grade. And this uh, really helped him as he, um, you know, move, uh, mature through the um, years. Uh, he married Matsu in uh, 1912, I believe, and they had seven children. In during the 1920s, uh, uh, to, we discovered through our family research, you know, we finding documents that he was. Um, I don't know what the word, he, he, he really started to mature as a businessman. Uh, they um, acquired and managed a grocery store. At the same time, he procured six acres of land on which he made a loan with Pow Pow Sugar Mill and he uh, used that land to farm sugarcane. In the 1930 census, I found that uh, he listed himself as a farmer. His wife, Matsu, listed herself as being a store, a, re a retail merchant. So this was uh, documentation proof that uh, they did manage a store. Uh, in, 19, in the 1930s, uh, uh, he did end up uh, closing the store and probably focused on his farm. Uh, he went back to Japan in 1938, uh, the year that his father passed. And he also explained later in his hearing with uh, the uh, army uh, interrogation that his mother was also ill during that time. He was very active in the community. And I think with his skill of being able to read and write, many of the uh, people living there could not read and write. And so they probably looked to him to help read letters from Japan or help, him, help them write letters to their families remaining in Japan. He was very active with the uh, uh, Jodo Mission Temple. And uh, he was also uh, very, um, he, he, he read a lot of books. He would hear about the Japanese soldiers being sick, being injured, and he would send monies to uh, agencies to lend, to help uh, lend assistance. And that was because I guess he was a very compassionate person. And all of this was used against him uh, uh, to force him to be an internee for the duration of the war. And on uh, March 7th, 1942, he was at my parents' home um, my parents had just lost their two-year-old daughter, so I'm, I'm figuring he must have been there to, uh, to lend comfort. But that's the day that the federal officials, we don't know, Army, FBI, local police, came to the house and arrested him. My sister, who's right here, was four and a half at the time, and she has this very distinct memory of that. And she would, she recalled yelling at her mom, why don't they let him finish his lunch? <laughs> so, at least she had some memories, so that was good.
But um, so anyway, they took him to KMC. And uh, knowing, I guess I've known about him going to KMC quite a while, but it was interesting, you know, that uh, during the pandemic, it was a very, um, a time that we, Annette and I learned a lot through researching, to her discovery of Dr. Gale, you know, seeing her book talk on Zoom, she acquired Dr. Gale's book, and finding that there were so much common things that her grandfather went through, and I'm figuring that's the same thing that my grandfather went through, and, and through our continued interactions through Zoom or in-person meetings, we started to reveal more and more of these similarities. And um, so I've been able to get several packages from the National Archives, uh, um, the historical documents of him being at uh, Santa Fe. And just last week, uh, through Granton's assistance, I was able to get information from Washington, D.C., from the War Department side. And that's where I've, I received the uh, uh, notes or the minutes of the hearings that my grandfather had to sit through and, and the final judgment that he was to be in turn for the duration of the war. And, um, and through all of this, um, when Gail brought up about, let's go to the Big Island, let's go to KMC, and uh, Annette and I were all for it. We wanted to go, because I've been through KMC and then I never had any inklings of that there was some about the camp being there. And I was thinking like, there probably is nothing there, but um, well, was I wrong? Uh, so we went to uh, Hilo and uh, two weeks ago, and on that Saturday, uh, Gail gave that her, her book talk, and she focused on uh, internees from the Hawaii Island. And I really, really enjoyed her presentation. She mentioned, um, I, I'll talk about that later. Um, so anyway, she allowed us, myself included, to give a little um, uh, story about our grandfathers. And I mentioned in my presentation about where up on the Big Island that he used to live. And it's in the area referred to as Pawilo Mauka on the Hamakua coast. And three women in the crowd all of a sudden cut notice of me. <laughs> uh, and um, I was, I was a, a little taken aback by that. But anyway, at the end of the, the program, the presentation, of, we, I met up with these uh, three ladies. And um, of these two were of particular interest. These two are descendants of, um, I forget his first name, Mr. Tahara. Who, Joichi. Jo, Joichi Tahara, thank you. Uh, he owned the Tahara store. It was a very popular location up in the area my uh, grandparents lived. And my parents back then, they would go to the to their store where at, they would show movies in their garage. And uh, many of my elder relatives would tell us stories about them doing this long walk from their homes over to the Tahara store so they could watch these um, movies. And uh, of course, they were silent movies, but they had people come and did the um, voiceover, I guess you would say. And uh, so it was such an exciting moment that we were able to meet and share. And what was so exciting is that Shelly, uh, this is Nyla and Shelly, 
Shelly shared that a memory that her mother had all the day that Mr. Tahara was picked up was that um, she remembered that the car that took them away, there was a Mr. Nakagawa in the car. And all these years, Shelly and the family was wondering who was that Mr. Nakagawa in the car? And now they found out that it was my grandfather, Nechiro. And that really got me excited because now um, we've, we found a bond that um, I've always, you know, knew about the Tatahara store. I knew one of their cousins on Facebook. <laughs> and uh, now we have this bond be because of this. And, uh, you yeah. know. So as during our meeting, I shared with them this digital map. It's a drawing that my elder cousins had put together by memory. Uh, this was done about 10, 12 years ago. And it included all the roads, the locations where the different families used to live. And it also had the location of Tahara's store and they were very excited that they could zoom in and see where the store was they could see familiar family names on there and then in that process i took i did a relook of the map and i discovered stuff that i hadn't realized before there's this black uh, boxes up this side Th these are showing the Ka'apahu Elementary School, and the smaller one above it is the Ka'apahu Language School, the Japanese Language School. And then below all of this is a uh, location it shows the Nakagawa store. So all of this, I, we've never known, we've, knew, we've heard about it, but we, now we actually know they, where they were located. So it was, of exciting times. So the um, next day, the s Sunday, we went out to KMC, and this is uh, Jalen, Dr. Jalen uh, Moniz Nakamura gave a, gave a tremendous uh, talk on a uh, walking tour, talking tour of the KMC and locations of what buildings that uh, were there during the, um, the internment. And uh, this is the building that was where the men used to stay at, li live at. And the way that uh, Dr. Jalen described the conditions as written by George Hoshida, this large room a hundred men would sleep on cots. And then the room next door was this wide open bathroom. No, no partitions at all. Just toilet bowls, urinals, sinks. So everybody knew what other, other person's business was happening there. And in the next room had their open shower stall where they had four showers. So it, it was sad, I, I felt sadness as uh, she was telling all this, how I'm wondering, you know, how my feelings my grandfather felt during this time. Um, such, um, I would think would be such an embarrassment to be, you know, sharing the facilities like that. So from KMC, they all went to Sand Island, and from Sand Island up to uh, the mainland. And uh, so Gil's uh, grandfather and my grandfather were in the same group, so they traveled from Sand Island to Angel Island, Angel Island to Fort Sam Houston in Texas, then on to Lordsburg in New Mexico, and finally in 
to Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, where they stayed for the duration. And um, one of the things that um, Gail mentioned in the talk at Hilo, she, where she focused on the Hawaii Isis, was about how these Ise men were forced to be interned against their will. And at the same time, their sons were being recruited, were drafted into the army to go fight for the very country that had their fathers locked up. And what's even sadder, what's really sad was she said that uh, some of these men lost their sons in the war. It was really, really sad. Well, for the Nakagawa family, um, that also happened, not to that extent, but uh, this is his son, Toshito, that they met in November 1944. Uh, we're still researching on uh, the exact unit he fought with, but um, so it, it also happened to us where his son was drafted. I don't know if he volunteered or was drafted, but he also served during the war and he did come back, so that was good. So um, after that wonderful experience that we had at Hilo with Dr. Gale and at KMC with Dr. Jalen, uh, the last thing I wanted to do before we left was to pay my, pay my respects to my grandfather where we visited his gravesite, his final resting spot at uh, the Jodo Mission in Honoka'a, where we offered uh, prayers and flowers. And I'm hoping that, uh, that uh, other members of my family especially the next generation, will uh, also be interested in what happened to our grandfathers. And um, will take a interest and take an positive steps in make, ensuring that such um, actions never happen again to any people in our country. So, uh, that's what I will continue to do, is to do more research, find more information, and share with all of, the, uh, all of my family members. So thank you very much.